New Year's is a time for parties, watching the ball drop on Central Park, counting down the seconds before midnight, and turning the calendar to a whole new year. At least it used to be when you were young enough to stay up until midnight. A lot of us now just go to bed at our normal time, and uh, if you were like me last night, uh, the fireworks that went off in uh, Moroa uh, let me know that it was midnight, and then I went back to sleep. <clears throat> but many take this time as an opportunity to reflect on the past year and perhaps project into the one that awaits. And one fixture that is very common in our culture is New Year's resolutions. We take the opportunity to start anew, promising ourselves and others to adopt new habits, to break old ones, to try to be a better person. Now, I think all this is well and good, except that New Year's resolutions are notoriously short-lived. This was reflected in the opening lines of a song that Carolyn Ahrens recorded a number of years ago entitled New Year's Day. She says, I buy a lot of diaries, fill them full of good intentions. Each and every New Year's Eve, I make myself a list. All the things I'm going to change until January 2nd. <laughs> and isn't that true? <laughs> A lot of times, all of our grand intentions, the promises we make, the resolutions we're going to keep into the new year don't last too much longer than the second day of the year. For whatever reasons, we tend not to follow through on these promises we make to ourselves. Now, I think sometimes the reason for that is the goals themselves might be unrealistic, like I want to run a marathon when I've never run around the block. <laughs> or uh, maybe they're unmeasurable. I want to be a nicer person this year. Well, how do you know if you've done that? Even as Christians, many of us make New Year's resolutions. I'm going to read the Bible more this year, one might pledge. Or I'm going to get up earlier every morning and spend more time in prayer. But too often we fall victim to that biblical truth, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So New Year's resolutions have really taken a negative tone for many. One person quipped, New Year's resolutions are like friends, they're easier to make than to keep. Another one joked, a New Year's resolution usually goes in one year and out the other. Now, on this January 1st, I would like to take a new look at New Year's, and particularly this idea of New Year's resolutions. I want to consider why they're often not kept, but also some encouraging truth from Scripture that can give us new perspective and a new hope in this new year. I want to begin with the practice of disappointing resolutions. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution and you find that you give it up in the first few weeks or maybe even the first few hours of the new year? If so, you're not alone. Researchers have discovered that 25% of New Year's resolutions are abandoned within the first week. One out of four don't make it one week into a new year. 60% are gone within six months. Of those who fail, the majority will make the same resolution year after year for as long as 10 years till they give up or they finally succeed in making that change that lasts at least six months. Another survey of 200 people who had made New Year's resolutions the previous year sincerely resolving to do better in various areas of their lives they found that half of them had broken their resolutions entirely by the end of January, and none of the 200 had made it through the year. So you're not alone if you find that uh, that's been your experience. Now, when you turn to the Bible, you won't find the phrase New Year's resolutions. They didn't use the, that terminology back then. 
uh, but you will find is the subject of a vow made to the Lord. And according to these verses, God took these vows very seriously. I want to begin in the book of Numbers, chapter 30. Numbers, chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. Moses said to the heads of the tribes of Israel, this is what the Lord commands. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. Pretty straightforward. If you're going to make a vow, do it. If you're going to make a promise, keep it. Then over in Deuteronomy, the next book over, chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, beginning in verse 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. Again, God takes this very seriously. And then over in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, we see a very similar idea and what God thinks of the vows that we make. Beginning in verse 4, when you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Vows are very important to God. When we make a vow or a promise to Him, we ought to keep it. Why is it then that we are so much better at breaking our promises than we are in keeping them? I think, again, the Bible gives us the answer. And this time it's in the New Testament. The book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans, chapter 7. Paul, I believe, gives a very honest revelation about himself in this chapter. Romans, chapter 7, beginning in verse 15. See if you can relate to these words. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, that's what I do. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. It is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? As you hear those words, <laughs> do you find yourself saying, yeah, I've been there. I, Paul, I know what you're talking about. That's my experience too. And I think when it comes to many of the New Year's resolutions that we make, our heart's in the right place. We really want to make changes in our lives. We want to start doing good. We want to stop doing what's not so healthy. But we find that we don't change. Dare I say we can't change. Why is that? Well, I think there's several practical reasons. 
Uh, oftentimes our resolutions are unrealistic. Sometimes they're more dependent upon others than ourselves, or they might out, lie outside our realm of control. But I think the biggest reason why resolutions tend to fail is that we depend on our own strength, our own willpower to carry it through, and that's what most of us lack. We find it much more comfortable to go back to the old way of doing things, our old habits, our old practices. Change is hard. Doing something new and continuing to do it, it's not easy. And oftentimes we get discouraged and we give up. Now Bible scholars argue whether Paul wrote these words in Romans 7 from the perspective of someone before they were saved or after. I believe the answer is found in verse 18. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. That desire, I believe, can only be said for a believer. An unbeliever doesn't want to please God. They couldn't care less. I think Paul is writing this as a believer, but a defeated believer. And yes, there are many Christians who are saved. Their faith is in God. They know where they're going to spend eternity but their life here on earth is a battle that they feel like they're constantly losing. They feel defeated, discouraged. They're ready to give up. They're saying like Paul did, what a wretched person I am. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? You know, the good news is found in the very next verse. This would be a tragic chapter if it ended in verse 24. But verse 25 says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's an answer. Who can rescue me? He can. And though we won't get into it today, if you get into the next chapter, which is Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about life in the Spirit. Going from I can't to He can. And because He lives in me, now I can. So there is hope. Sure, we may deal with uh, the, the, these disappointing resolutions, but there is hope. There is an answer. And that possibility of change lies in the promise of divine renewal. Simply put, we have hope when we allow God to do what we cannot do ourselves. And that is making fundamental changes in our personalities. One of the most amazing passages of hope in all the Bible is found in a book whose very title reflects hopelessness. It was the passage that was read for us earlier, Lamentations. How many of you have ever heard a series of sermons preached in the book of Lamentations? Not a one. How many of you heard a sermon preached out of the book of Lamentations? Probably not. The word itself means funeral songs. It's one of the most depressing books in the Bible. It was written by Jeremiah, who is called the weeping prophet. And the setting of the book is after the city of Jerusalem, his hometown, is destroyed. He's walking through the streets, lamenting. Everything that he sees. The destruction. Imagine a Ukrainian walking through the streets of his or her hometown that has been bombed out by the Russians. Completely overrun. Bodies are still lying where they fell. And they're pouring their hearts out. That's the book of Lamentations. You say, why on earth would that even be included in the Bible? I think it has a very fitting place in Scripture. If I were to give Lamentations a subtitle, it would be The Wages of Sin. 
Jerusalem fell because of the unrepentant sin of its people. And Jeremiah shows us the awful Christ tag sin exacts. But right in the middle of that book, in chapter 3, we read an amazing statement of hope. Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. Actually, I'm going to go back to verse 19. It's not on the slide, but bear with me. Because it gives you the, the, the context. Jeremiah writes, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. That's pretty much the whole book of Lamentations up to this point. He is looking around at the destruction of sin and he's depressed. He's downcast. They didn't have a word for depression in Hebrew. This is it. Yet, verse 21 begins, Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Sun is streaming through the clouds. There's hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to the one whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. When there seems to be no hope, there is hope. Why? Because God is faithful. And there's one line in that passage that I think really sheds light on the subject this morning. They are new every morning. Every morning, God's mercies, His love is new. Not every year, not every month, not even every week, every day, every morning. With every sunrise, there's hope. You say, well, that's fine. He's God. I'm not. <laughs> How's that help me in following through on my commitments? Well, there's another promise that answers that question. And i got to be honest with you. When I first read it, I thought I read it wrong. I had to reread it again because I thought, nah, that can't be right. It's in the New Testament. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. In some of your Bibles you'll see that this is indented. It's like a poem. Some have even thought it might be an, an ancient hymn of the church. Beginning in verse 11, here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we disown Him, He will disown us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. For He cannot disown Himself. You know, as you go through those verses, there's, there's a, a rhythm to it, isn't there? You know, you know if, if we died with Him, we'll live with Him. If we endure, we'll reign with Him. If we disown Him, He'll disown us. If we are faithless, we expect He's going to drop us like a rock, right? No. He remains faithful, even when we are faithless. Now you say, well, what's the difference between faithless and disown? Because in the last phrase it says He'll disown us. Disowning God is an act of the will that says, I'm not going to follow anymore. And I believe when a person gets to that point, God honors that. My dad used to say, you'll never see anybody being dragged into heaven by the scruff of his neck, kicking and screaming, saying, I don't want to go. 
But when we are faithless, that's describing the person who's really wanting to change, who's really trying to live the Christian life, but because of our humanity, we, we fail. We stumble, we fall. We don't come through with those promises we've made to ourselves and even to God. But He is faithful. He does not give up on us. And here's something I want you to hear this morning. God wants you to succeed even more than you do. As much as you want to make those changes, God wants it even more. And when you are willing to walk with Him, He's going to make sure it happens. Because He remains faithful. New Year's resolutions. Many of us make them, most of us break them. They cover everything from being a better person to eating healthier, working out at the gym, memorizing scripture, watching less sports on TV or whatever. The simplest definition of a resolution is a firm decision to do or not do something. And in January, our resolutions resound with determination. It's offering the potential for a new beginning. By May, most of those resolutions merely remind us of through their nagging presence that we didn't quite reach our goals, and by December, most of us have forgotten them entirely. Now, whether or not you join with the millions in making New Year's resolutions, I want to remind you that there is one who has kept every resolution he's ever made. He keeps his promises. We read in his word, he who promised is faithful. Even if we are not able to stick it out, even if we don't make it to the gym every day, if we can't stay away from the chocolate or bite our tongue rather than beat others with it, God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. And He has resolved that your life is going to be a great life. It's going to be a life of purpose, one filled with a future and a hope. And the surest way of living out your purpose is to fix your eyes on the unchanging faithfulness of the one who has promised that goodness and loving kindness will follow you when you follow him. Our God is faithful. And that's the promise of divine renewal in our lives. As I conclude, I want to get practical. And I want to address the practice of daily resolve. Yes, it is true. We are weak in our own selves. Yes, it is true. God is faithful even when we are faithless. But we still have an obligation. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Now it is required to those who have been giving a trust must prove faithful. There's that word again faithful. Most of us want to be faithful to the Lord, yet many of us fail, or at least we feel like we fail. How can we change that? Well, not to sound cliche, but those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Many of us have a vague sense of wanting to do better, to be better, and yet we fail to establish a plan on how to get there. So I want us to focus on another verse Paul wrote, this in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. So we make it our goal to please Him. This is a summary of the Christian life. It's our goal to please Him. Some English translations use the word aim. I was reminded of the words of the late Howard Hendricks. He says, Objectives always determine outcome. Form always follows function. You achieve that for which you aim. And if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time, right? So instead of making New Year's resolutions this year, I want to suggest that we make goals. And not just any goals, but smart 
goals. And using that term, I don't just mean intelligent goals, but using SMART as an acronym, where each letter of that word stands for an idea. And I really believe that if we would take this practice off when we have of these New Year's resolutions, but turn them into SMART goals, we'll have a much better chance of actually fulfilling them. So let me break this down briefly for you. Specific. Often we promise, I'm going to do my best. Okay, what's that mean? <laughs> I want to be healthier. Well, sure, that's a good idea, but how do you, how do you know if you've done it? <laughs> How do you aim for something that is so vague? There's no way of measuring success. When we set goals, we need to be very specific and narrow. Instead of saying, I want to be healthier, set a goal to exercise so many times a week, to lose a number of pounds. Instead of thinking, I want to pray more, set a goal. Be specific. I want to pray so many minutes a day. I want to pray every day. Goals need to be specific. Secondly, goals need to be measurable. In order to know if I've reached the goal, there must be some way of measuring pro progress. You ask yourself, how much? How many? How will I know when this goal is accomplished? We also need to consider what evidence can I give of progress? What milestones along the way can I set? When will I reevaluate? And if necessary, course correct. These milestones should be set up in shorter inter intervals so that we can know if we're on track or if we need to make some adjustments. If somebody wants to make a goal, I want to run a marathon this year. You're probably not going to do that next week, are you? You're going to need to build up to that. So maybe you say, well, at the end of each month, I want to be able to run so, so far. And you build up toward that. If your goal is, I want to pray an hour a day, I wouldn't suggest you try 60 minutes tomorrow. If your normal practice has been less than 60 seconds. Start small, work your way up, and have these milestones where at the end of the month you evaluate. How many days did I pray? Was I able to pray that long? Make it measurable. Next, it needs to be achievable. This is where a lot of New Year's resolutions fall apart. You know, we might say, I'm going to lose 100 pounds in three weeks. Now that's specific, that's measurable, but I'm not sure it's achievable. I'm not sure it ought to be achievable. <laughs> they have to be realistic. We need to make goals that can be accomplished in a reasonable time frame. We want to set yourself up for success and not failure. Now goals ought to be challenging, else we get bored. But they need to be attainable. Make sure that we have the time the resources and the abilities to achieve that goal. The R in SMART stands for relevant. And what I mean by that is goals need to align with our values and our broader objectives of life. Am I setting this goal because I feel it's important or because I think others are expecting it from me? How is this going to impact my marriage, my relationship to my children, my job, my church, how is it going to impact? We need to think through these things. How is this going to affect my spouse or my family's needs? In accomplishing this goal, am I neglecting them? All of that needs to be brought into consideration. And then finally, time-related. Each goal needs to have an end date. For one thing, that provides motivation. But make sure that end date's realistic. Providing a time constraint produces urgency and motivation to get it done. 
Otherwise, we can drag it out indefinitely and achieve nothing. Now, if we get to that end date and it wasn't met, ask yourself, why? Was this unrealistic? Were there obstacles that got in the way? And if so, set it up and try it again. In setting these SMART goals, I believe we should bathe the whole process in prayer. Prayer is important in the change process, and so is a regular commitment to the guidance and the influence of the Holy Spirit. Often, however, spiritual changes come in the context of relationships when others can give us practical advice and prayer support that can help us succeed. Accountability is another great thing if you're making a goal. Have somebody that will regularly check in with you and say, how are you doing? Not that they're going to beat you up if you don't, but they can encourage you. And knowing that someone's going to be asking you that can be a great motivator to get it done. All of these things can come together to help us achieve those things that we set for ourselves. I want to wrap up with two passages from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Paul writes this, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I understand you may have made New Year's resolutions in the past and watched them fail. You may have convinced yourself that you are unable to change, that you're unable to make and keep such goals. Follow Paul's advice here. Forget the past. What's past is past and you can't change it. Look ahead. Focus ahead. Make new goals. Goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-oriented. Find someone that will keep you accountable and move forward. The second verse is in the next chapter, chapter 4 and verse 13. A verse I'm sure you've heard on many occasions. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now it's true. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. Paul shows the other side here. Through Christ we can do all things. He gives us the strength. Don't try to do it on your own. But in his strength, it can happen. See, that's why New Year's resolutions rarely last. They're simply attempts to manage the mess through external means. God doesn't work that way. God works from the inside out. He works in our spirit first, then to the soul, and finally to the body. So if you want your body to be victorious, you want to make changes on the outside, start on the inside. Tap into His strength by which we can do all things. In conclusion, I want to go back to the song lyrics that I had mentioned at the beginning of the message to see a new look at New Year's. I buy a lot of diaries, fill them with good intentions. Each and every New Year's Eve, I make myself a list. All the things I'm going to change until January 2nd. So this time I'm making one promise. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's Day. I believe it's possible. I believe in new beginnings. Because I believe in Christmas Day and, and Easter morning too. And I'm convinced it's doable because I believe in second chances. Just the way I believe in you. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's Day. This could start a revolution. 
Every day is one more chance to start all over, one more chance to change and grow, one more chance to grab a hold of grace and never let it go. This will be my resolution. Every day is New Year's Day. God's mercies are new every morning. If we stumble and fall today, He is still faithful. He will enable us to start anew. I think one of the problems that we have, at least I have, I've found this true in my life. If I fail, I want to quit. Maybe I've done really good with my New Year's resolution. I've made it through a week, two weeks, three weeks. Maybe I've got through a month, a couple of months, and then I forget and I fail. And I just want to say, forget it. It's over. It's done. I can't do it. I failed. It's over. Every day is a new beginning. Every day can be New Year's Day. God wants to do something new in you. Don't give up. He knows what we're made of. He knows that we're dust. He knows that we, in our humanity, will fail. But He's there. He is faithful even when we are faithless. Every day is New Year's Day. Start anew and see what God will do in your life. Will you bow with me in prayer? God, I thank you that you are a God of new beginnings. That you are a God who is faithful even when we are faithless. That you want us to succeed even more than we do. That through your strength we can do anything. And I pray that as we begin a new year, maybe we've made promises to ourselves, to you, to others. I pray that we would make these promises practical and attainable. And that we would rely on your strength to fulfill them. But even when we fail, we won't quit. But we'll start anew because every morning your mercies are new. Every day is a new beginning. Help us to adopt that attitude. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.